Hello and welcome to SomaticWise. Now I haven't put out any videos in quite a while because my clinical practice has kept me really busy. As we know, this last year and a half have been pretty challenging for almost everyone. I'm really glad though to see so many people accessing mental health services and self-care. So then, this video is a long overdue update about my little urban biodiversity oasis. I made up the term urban biodiversity oasis to convey a particular concept. My thought is that average people can be good stewards of our outdoor spaces so as to actively support and provide refuge for biodiversity. Now, the term biodiversity simply means differences between life forms, lots of different life. We can have biodiversity within a species and biodiversity between species. Basically, when you have genetic diversity, you have many more options available to solve problems, which is really cool. You also have better balance in the ecosystems. Biodiversity is really important because it creates the very web of life that makes it possible for life to survive on this planet. The web of life is very complex and it cannot survive without a multiplicity of different organisms all filling different things in the ecosystems. Biodiversity creates the biochemical reactions and balances that give us breathable air, food, water, and temperature and climate regulation. These are things that we tend to take for granted, but as we know, they're starting to diminish. This is because human activities are destroying so much natural habitat, wildlife, and resources. So now, every little scrap we can provide really does count. You know, they say there's an XKCD comic for everything, and here it is, right here. Did you know that humans and their livestock now comprise 96% of the biomass of mammals on Earth? The term biomass just means the weight of living things. How much of each living thing belongs to what species? Humans and livestock are now 96%. That leaves only 4% for things like whales, bears, meerkats, beavers, and everything else. That is a massive imbalance. We are dominating everything and everything else is losing out. Urban gardens absolutely can be part of the solution and they really help people too. The way I'm doing my bar garden as an urban biodiversity oasis is like this. First of all, I have a heavy concentration of locally native plant species because these are the plants that insects, birds, and other wildlife have fed on and depended on for thousands of years. These plants really help reestablish the ecosystem. Or if my plants are not native, they're either organic gardening, that is they're producing food without pesticides, such as avocado trees and fig trees and stuff in my raised beds, or they're plants that are actively useful to the ecosystem in some way. And in my space, I'm not using any pesticides, herbicides, lawnmowers, fumes, or toxic chemicals. So the really cool thing about gardening like this is that when you have such a garden, the beauty and wonder that it inherently produces also tend to make people feel really good. My own garden is enchanting. It's a living system. Every time I come out there every day, there's something new and different and beautiful going on. There's always some sort of change or growth. It has been a deeply supportive resource to me during these past 18 months. And even if you don't have a house with a yard, you can still do this. Container gardening is totally a thing. And there's some gorgeous container gardens in smaller spaces out there when people don't have access directly into the soil. Every little bit helps. I just bought some native plants from an apartment dweller who created this whole beautiful garden outside his front door. And in doing so, he also helped to educate the conventional gardeners that were sent by his landlord. He's also got a bunch of plants on his deck that he started from seed and they're just beautiful. And the butterflies and everything are coming right there too. Seeds are inexpensive and can be shared within a community. Many communities have a buy nothing group on Facebook. My local one has frequent giveaways for plants, pots, potting soil, stuff like that. There's a man named Ron Finley and he's got some really interesting and useful work about gardening in the inner cities, creating food sanctuaries for people and with people, encouraging good nutrition and doing away with food dependence and food deserts, which is when there's not nutritious food for people anywhere within their reach. 
I really encourage you to look him up. Along the lines of the biodiversity oasis, a botanist named Doug Tallamy also has a very interesting body of work. He encourages people to plant locally native plants, and then if a lot of people did so, there would be so much land mass supporting biodiversity right here in the United States, we could create what he calls a homegrown national park. How cool is that? Nature is so deeply regulating to people and so good for us, why not? deliberately develop a little patch of it very close to you. So with these videos, I'm just offering my experience in my garden as one example of what gardening like this can be like. Obviously, some of the details are going to be different in different geographic areas. However, I do think some details will apply most places, as will the general principles. So here are some things I've observed and learned recently. Now this is just food for thought, a possible starting, starting point for folks. I'm not an expert. Please do not depend on me for any of this information. So one update is that we've had a particularly mild winter here in Southern California. The bad part about this is that it's creating tremendous droughts across the Southwest. And my rain barrels are pretty much empty. This film is from last year. On the other hand, one silver lining is that this sunflower, Helianthus annus, which is a locally native common sunflower, it didn't really get the memo that it's supposed to be an annual plant. That is one that dies off every winter. So this is its second summer and it's going really strong. It's just gorgeous and it's providing all sorts of pollinators with good stuff to eat. Another little update is that since I have the space, I got a second composter so I could take in food scraps, um, compost from neighbors and apartments. Composting keeps food scraps out of the waste stream in the landfill, and it breaks them back down into nutrients for the soil, and this supports our natural nutrient cycles and helps restore soil. So here's a little update about buckwheat. The biome in coastal Southern California is called coastal sage scrub. Here, and I think in the chaparral environment too, a buckwheat or aragonium is just such a superstar in the garden. The pollinators love the blossoms, and then when these blossoms brown and drop seed, it gives the birds a lot of food. Also, they require very little water. Tree of Life Native Plant Nursery in San Juan Capistrano has a campaign, a buckwheat in every garden, because they're such rock stars, and they were giving some away. You might check with them and see if they still have this going. Okay, so here's a little update about soil. I highly recommend getting a soil test before starting to plant in the ground. I finally tested my soil just as the pandemic began and unfortunately the results showed it ha does have some lead contamination. My understanding is that this is a very common issue for those who live in old houses or buildings or where the city's been established for a long time because people used to use lead-based paint and lead-based gasoline. This is really important for people to know if they have young kids that might want to play in the soil and inadvertently expose themselves to lead. So for me, I don't have kids, but I moved all my edible plants into raised beds or containers to avoid lead contamination. I understand that it's also important to cover any contaminated soil with mulch so it doesn't blow around and you breathe it. Mulch is basically shredded trees. Personally, I don't use rubber or dyed mulch because as it breaks down, it usually sheds toxins into the soil. Natural mulch covers the ground, helps hold in moisture, and it breaks down into nutrients, which helps bioremediate the soil. Healthy plants and healthy soil also sequester carbon, and we all know what's happening with having too much carbon in the atmosphere. It needs to go back to the ground, and healthy gardens can totally help with this. I'm also helping heal my soil with scented geraniums. I found a study that shows that certain species of them are effective at pulling lead out of the soil. And also these beautiful sunflowers. These Russian giant sunflowers are truly amazing. In addition to removing soil contaminants, they also provide microhabitats, which means that they're useful in supporting the ecosystem. Remember the biodiversity. There's so many kinds of little nits and bugs I can't even identify, and then ladybugs and things eating them. That's biodiversity right there. And then every evening, I wish I had a movie of this, the hummingbirds come and swoop around the big stalks and they eat the little bugs. 
However, we did have a squirrel crisis a few weeks ago. These little fox squirrels are not locally native. I learned in my naturalist class that they were brought here by southerners who miss their squirrels back home, and now they've largely displaced some more shy native gray squirrels. They're really cute and really funny, but they don't have predators here, and they're out getting it really out of balance. And they decapitated my glorious sunflowers, which are taller than me, and they tore the heads off even before the seeds finished developing. One by one. The only way I could stop them was by dousing the remaining one that I had with cayenne pepper. So even though it's late in the season now, I sprouted some more and am planting them to see how well they do. I'm also trying a product called Squirrel Mace, which they say is completely organic, nothing toxic, and mostly comprised of cayenne and peppermint oil. So here's an update on monarchs. The western monarch butterfly is in terrible decline by recent counts the population is only 1% of what it should be, 1%. So please, please, please plant milkweed, lots of milkweed, and make sure it hasn't had any pesticides from the grower. The caterpillars will die. My yard has lots of milkweed, mostly native, but some tropical as well. I do have some tropical because I discovered it's genuinely useful for the monarchs, especially when they've eaten all the native variety already and it hasn't grown back yet. Last year, they seemed to prefer the tropical milkweed, but this year, the monarch caterpillars are totally jamming on the native narrowleaf milkweed, and I don't know why, that's what they're doing. On a side note, I'm not hand-raising monarchs because I found out that according to the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, it is unlawful to do so. I'm not a lawyer. This is what I have read and understood as a layperson. The concern being that hand rearing may have subtle weakening effects on species. So I am told that people raising hand rearing monarchs or having the any in captivity in California could potentially be subject to citation and large fines. Again, I'm not a lawyer. This is not legal advice. All these monarchs you see here in my garden are completely free. I don't touch them and there's lots of them. Aren't they just gorgeous and amazing creatures? The real main problem here is that humans have developed so much of their habitat and also use pesticides. Milkweed is the only thing these caterpillars can eat, so please plant locally native milkweed and make sure it dies down or you cut it down a few times per year to reduce fungal infection to the butterflies. And people and pets should be really careful around it. The quote unquote milk inside of it is toxic. I would not want to get it in my eyes. I would not want to let young kids or pets anywhere near it. Another thing I'm doing is I start propagating locally native plants so I can give them away. Most of what nurseries offer for sale are sadly not locally native, which means they're not educating the public about what the ecosystem needs. And it means they support much less biodiversity. And who really wants a sterile garden anyway? For me, I consider this being of service. It's pretty much like tithing. I'm paying some of my time and energy and money forward into what spiritually sustains me. It's easy and fun to propagate from cuttings, tending the little baby plants until their root systems take off and they grow, and then you give them away to community members and you get to form relationships that way. It's super cool. Wildlife habitat requires a water source, so we have this bird bath. The rocks are so that bees and other insects can climb out instead of drowning. We had a pond for a while, but the raccoons trashed it, and we haven't rebuilt it yet. And speaking of raccoons, I also learned that their poop can harbor very toxic parasites and bacteria. So I'm really glad I'm aware of this. In my house, we double mask, wear gloves, and have really long-handled scoopers to pick it up and bag it and tie it up immediately. My house doesn't have any kids, but we keep Daisy far away from any droppings in the yard. Lastly, this little bird is called a black Phoebe. I love to watch them. They're very cute, brave little birds. They're insect eaters. They like to perch on the fence here, constantly swoop down and snatch little bugs like this one is doing here right out of the air. And then they stand on the fence and gulp, gulp, and then they do it again. Another reason to not use pesticides because that takes away this little bird's food. And speaking of birds, a little morning dove was born in the garden oasis. Here's a little fledgling right here who can't fly yet, so the parents are always around standing guard. 
This little bird is so vulnerable and innocent, my heart cracked wide open. Live long and fly free, little one, and I'm sure your parents will stay with you until you're ready to take wing. So that's the update for now. If you'd like to make some comments, or better yet, even a little video about your biodiversity oasis, please do post in the comments below. Thank you for watching SomaticWise, and remember to do what lights you up inside. Thank you for watching this video. If you would like to support my work of getting this information out into the world, you could subscribe to receive notification of future videos. You could contribute to my Patreon account to support this channel. And of course, please feel free to share this video with others. Take care. Until next time, be well.